All right, today's topic is distributed transactions. Um, and these come in really um, two implementation pieces, and that's how I'll cover them. Um, the first big piece is concurrency control. Uh, the second is atomic commit. Um, and the reason why distributed transactions come up is that it's very frequent for people with large amounts of data to end up splitting or sharding the data over many different servers. So maybe if you're running a bank, for example, the bank balances for half of your customers are one server and the bank balances for the other half are on a different server. That's to like split the load, both the processing load and the uh, space requirements. Um, this comes up for other things too. Maybe you're recording vote counts on articles at a website. You know, the, maybe there's so many millions and millions of articles, half the vote counts are, in, are on uh, one server and half the vote counts are on another. Um, but some operations require touching, modifying, or reading data on multiple different servers. So if we're doing a bank transfer from one customer to another, well, their balances may be on different servers. And therefore, in order to do the balance, we have to modify data, read and write data, on two different servers. Um, and we'd really like to, um, or one way of building these systems, and we'll see others later on in the course, one way to build the system is try to hide the complexity of splitting this data across multiple servers, try to hide it from the application programmer. Um, and this is like a traditionally a, has been a database concern for, for many decades. Um, and so a lot of today's material originated with databases. But the ideas have been used much more widely in um, distributed systems, which you wouldn't necessarily call a traditional database. Um, the way people uh, sort of uh, usually package up concurrency control plus um, atomic commit is in an abstraction called a transaction, which we've seen before. Um, and the idea is that the programmer you know, has a bunch of different operations, maybe on different records in the database. They'd like all those operations to be sort of a single unit and, and not split by failures or by observation from other activities. Um, and the transaction processing system will require the programmer to mark the beginning and the end of that sequence of reading and writing and updating operations um, in order to mark the beginning and end of the transaction. And the transaction processing system has certain, will uh, provide certain guarantees about what happens between the beginning and the end. So for example, um, supposing we're running our bank and we want to do a transfer from the account of user x to the account of user y. Now, these balances for the both of them start out as 10. So initially, um, x equals 10, y equals 10. And x and y I'm, I'm, uh, mean to be records in a database. Um, and we want to transfer. Uh, we want to actually imagine that there's two transactions that might be running at the same time, one to transfer a dollar from account x to account y, and the other transaction to do an audit of, of all the accounts at the bank to make sure that the total amount of money in the bank never changes. Because after all, if you do transfers, you know, the total shouldn't change even if you move money between accounts. Um, in order to express this with transactions, um, we might have two transactions. The first transaction, we'll call it T1, is the transfer. Um, we'll mark the programmer, it's expected to mark the beginning of it with the begin transaction which I'll write as begin x. Um, and then the operations on the two balances, on the two records in the database. So we might add one, might add one to the balance x and add minus one to y. And then we need to mark the end of the transaction. Currently, we might have a, a um, transaction that's going to check all the balance, do an audit of all the balances, find the sum, or look at all the balances, make sure they add up to the number that doesn't change despite transfers. Um, so a second transaction we might be thinking about 
the audit transaction. Also, we need to mark the beginning and end. This time we're just reading. This is a read-only transaction. Um, we need to get the current uh, balances of all the accounts. Let's say we're just these two accounts for now. So um, we have two temporary variables we're going to read. So first one is going to be the value of uh, balance x. I'll just write get to mean we're reading that record. Um, we also read y. And we print them both. And that's the end of the transaction. And the question is, what are legal results from these two transactions? That's the first thing we want to establish is what are, you know, given the starting state, namely the two uh, balances for $10, you know, what could be the final results after you run both of these transactions maybe at the same time? Um, so we need a notion of what would be correct. And once we know that, we need um, to be able to build machinery that will actually be able to execute these transactions um, and get only those correct answers despite concurrency and failures. So first, what's correctness? Well, uh, databases usually um, have a notion of correctness called ACID. or abbreviated as ACID, and this stands for um, atomic. And this means that uh, a transaction that has multiple steps, you know, maybe writes multiple different records, if there's a failure, despite failures, either all of the writes should be done or none of them. Um, it shouldn't be the case that a failure at an awkward time in the middle of a transaction should leave half the updates completed and visible and half the updates never done. So it's all or nothing. So this is um, all or none despite failures. Uh, the C stands for consistent. It's actually, we're not going to worry about that. That's um, usually meant to refer to the fact that a database will enforce certain invariants declared by the application. Um, it's, it's not really our concern today. The I, though, is quite important. It usually stands for isolated. And this is really a property of whether or not two transactions that run at the same time can see each other's changes before the transactions have finished, whether or not they can see sort of intermediate updates in the, from the middle of another transaction. Um, and, you know, the goal is no. Um, and the sort of technical specific thing that most people generally mean um, by isolation is that the transaction execution is serializable. And I'll explain what that means in a bit. But it boils down to uh, transactions can't see each other's changes, can't see intermediate states, but only complete transaction results. And the final D stands for durable. And this means that after a transaction commits, after the client or whatever program that submitted the transaction gets a uh, reply back from the database saying, yes, you know, we've executed your transaction, um, the D in ACID is, um, means that the transactions modifications to the database will be durable, that they'll still be there. They won't be erased by a, some sort of failure. Um, and in practice, that means that uh, stuff has to be written to some non-volatile storage, persistent storage like a disk. Um, and so today, our, in fact, for this whole course, really, our concerns are going to revolve around um, good behavior with respect to failure, good, good uh, behavior with respect to other um, multiple parallel activities, and making sure that the data is there, still there after a, a um, even if something crashes. So um, the uh, most interesting part of this for us is the specific definition of, is of isolated or um, serializable. So I'm going to lay that out before, uh, before talking about how it actually applies to these transactions. So um, the I in isolated is usually means serializable. 
And the definition for this, um, if a set of transactions executes you know, concurrently, more or less at the same time, um, they yield a set of results. And here, the results refer to both the new database records uh, created by any modifications the transactions might do, and in addition, any output that the transactions produce. So for our transactions, these two ads, since they change records, they are, these change records are part of the results, and the output of this print statement is part of the results. So the definition of serializable says um, the results are serializable um, if there exists some order um, of execution of the transactions um, So we're going to say a, a specific execution, parallel, concurrent execution of transactions is serializable if there exists some serial order. I'm really emphasizing serial here. A serial order of execution of those same transactions that yields the same result as the actual execution. And the difference here is the actual execution may have had a lot of parallelism in it. Um, but um, it's required to produce the same result as some one-at-a-time execution of the same transactions. And so the way you check whether an execution is serializable, whether some concurrent execution is serializable, is you look at the results and see if you can find actually some one-at-a-time execution of the same transactions that does produce the same results. So for our transactions up here, um, there's only two orders. There's only two one-at-a-time serial orders available. Transaction one, then transaction two, or transaction two, then transaction one. And so we can just look um, at the results that they would produce if executed one at a time in each of these orders. So if we execute T1 and then T2, then we get X equals 11, Y equals nine, and this print statement, since T1 executed first, this print statement sees these two updated values. And so it'll print the string 11, 9. The other possible order is that perhaps T2 ran first and then T1. And in that case, T2 will see the uh, two records before they were modified, uh, but the modifications will still take place since T1 runs later. So the final results will again be x equals 11, y equals 9, but this time T2 saw the before values. So these are the two um, legal results for serializability. Um, and if we ever see anything else from running these two transactions at the same time, we'll know that the database we're running against does not provide serializable execution. It's doing something else. Um, and so while we're thinking through, oh, what would happen if, um, or what would happen if will always be against these, uh, these are the only two legal results. We better be doing something that produces one or the other. It's interesting to note that um, there's more than one possible result, uh, depending on the actual order. You, if, you, if you submit these two transactions at the same time, you don't know whether it's going to be T1, T2, or T2, T1. Uh, so you have to be willing to expect uh, more than one possible legal result. And as you have more transactions running concurrently and more complicated, there may be many, many possible different correct results that are all serializable because uh, there's many, many orders here uh, that could be used to fulfill this requirement. Okay, so now that we have a definition of correctness and we even know what all the possible results are, uh, we can ask a, a few questions um, so a few what-if questions about how these could execute. So for example, um, suppose that the way the system actually executed this was that it started transaction two and got as far as um, just after reading X, and then transaction one ran at this point, 
And then after transaction one finished, transaction two continue executing. Um, now, it turns out in, in, with a different other transactions than this, that might actually be legal. Um, but here we want to know uh, if it's legal. So we're wondering, gosh, if we ex executed that way, what results will we get? And are they the same as either of these two? Well, um, if we execute transaction one here, then T1 is going to see value 10. T2 is going to see the value after decrementing y. So T1 will be 10, T2 will be 9, and what this print will be 10, 9. And that's neither of these two outputs here. So that means executing in this way that I just drew is not serializable. It would not be legal. Um, another interesting question is, what if we started executing transaction one and we got as far as just after the first add, and, and then at that point, all of transaction two executed right here. Um, so that would mean at this point, x has value 11. The transaction two would read um, 11, 10, or print 11, 10, and 11, 10 is not one of these two legal values. So this execution is also not legal for these two transactions. So um, the reason why serializable, serializability is a popular and useful definition of what it means for transactions to be correct, for execution of transactions to be correct, is that it's a very easy model for programmers. You can write complicated transactions without having to worry about what else may be running in the system. There may be lots of other transactions, maybe using the same data as you, maybe read, trying to read and write it at the same time. There might be failures, who knows? Um, but uh, the guarantee here is that it's safe to write your transactions as if nothing else was happening because the final results have to be as if um, your transaction was executed by itself in this one at a time order, which is a very simple, very nice programming model. Um, it's also nice that um, this definition allows truly parallel execution of transactions as long as they don't use the same data. So we run into trouble here because these two transactions are both reading X and Y. But if they were using completely disjoint uh, database records, they could tr it turns out this definition allows you to build a database system that would execute transactions that use disjoint data completely in parallel. And if you have a sharded system, which is what we're sort of working up to today, where the data different data on different machines, you can get true parallel speed up because maybe one transaction executes purely in the first shard on the first machine and the other in parallel on the second machine. Um, so there are opportunities here for, uh, for good performance. Um, before I dig into how to implement serializable transactions, um, uh, there's one more small point I, I want to bring up. It turns out that um, uh, one of the things we need to be able to cope with is that transactions may, for one reason or another, uh, basically f fail um, or decide to fail in the middle of the transaction. Um, and this is usually called an abort. Um, and you know, for many transaction systems, we need to be prepared to handle, oh, what should happen if a transaction tries to access a record that doesn't exist or divides by zero? or Maybe, you know, since some transaction implementation schemes use locking, maybe a transaction causes a locking deadlock. And the only way to break the deadlock is to kill one, of the, one or more of the transactions that's participating in the, um, in the deadlock. So one of the things that's, that's uh, going to be kind of hanging in the background and will come up is the necessity of coping with transactions that all of a sudden in the middle decide they just cannot proceed. Um, and you know, maybe really in the middle after they've done some work and started modifying things. We need to be able to kind of uh, back out of these transactions and undo any modifications they've made. All right. Um, the implementation strategy for transactions, for these ACID transactions, um, I'm going to split into two big pieces but, and talk about both of them, the, the main topics in the lecture. Um, the first big implementation topic is concurrency control. Um, and this is 
um, the main tool we use to provide serializability for the current or isolation. So concurrency control will bias um, bias isolation from other uh, concurrent transactions that might be trying to use the same data. Um, and the other big piece that I mentioned is atomic commit, and this is uh, what's going to help us deal with the possibility that, um, oh, yeah, this transaction is executing along, and it's maybe modified X, and then all of a sudden um, there's a failure in one of the servers involved. Uh, but other servers that were maybe executing other parts of the transaction, that is, it's X and Y are in different machines, um, we need to be able to recover even if there's a partial failure of only some of the machines the transaction's running on. And uh, the big tool people use for that is this atomic commit, which we'll talk about. All right, so first, concurrency control. Um, there's really two classes, two major approaches to concurrency control. And we'll talk about both uh, during the course. Um, these are just uh, main strategies. The first strategy is a pessimistic, usually called pessimist, pessimistic concurrency control. And this is usually locking. We've all done locking in the labs in the context of Go programs. So it turns out databases, transaction processing systems also use locking. Um, and the idea here is you basically is the same as one you're quite familiar with is that before a transaction uses any data, it needs to acquire a lock on that data. And if some other transactions are already using the data, the lock will be held, and we'll have to wait before we can acquire the lock, wait for the other transaction to finish. Um, and in pessimistic systems, if there's locking conflicts, somebody else has the lock, it'll cause delays. Um, so you're sort of trading performance um, for correctness. The other main approach is optimistic approaches. The basic idea here is you don't worry about whether maybe some other transaction is reading or writing the data at the same time as you. You just go ahead and do whatever reads and writes you're going to do, although typically into some sort of temporary area. And then only at the end um, do you go and check whether actually maybe some other transaction might have been interfering. And if there's no other transaction, ah, oh, you're done. And you never had to go through any of the overhead or waiting of taking out locks. Because the locks are reasonably expensive to manipulate. Um, but if somebody else was modifying the data in a conflicting way um, at the same time you were, then you have to abort that transaction and retry. Um, and uh, the, the abbreviation for this is often optimistic concurrency control. Um, it turns out that under different circumstances, these two strategies, one can be faster than the other. Um, if conflicts are very frequent, you probably actually want to use pessimistic concurrency control. Uh, because if conflicts are frequent, you're going to get a lot of aborts due to conflicts for optimistic schemes. If conflicts are rare, then optimistic concurrency control um, can be faster because it completely avoids locking overhead. Um, today will be all about pessimistic concurrency control. Um, and then some uh, later paper, in particular farm, in a couple weeks, will deal with an optimistic scheme. OK, so today, I'm talking about pessimistic schemes. It refers basically to locking. Um, and in particular for today, the reading was about two-phase locking, which is the most um, common type of locking. And the idea in two-phase locking for transactions is that a transaction is going to use a bunch of records, like x and y in our example. Um, the first rule is that you acquire a lock before using data, any piece of data, before reading or writing any record. Um, and the second rule for transactions is that a transaction must hold any locks it acquires until after it commits or aborts. So you're not allowed to give up locks in the middle of the transaction. You have to hold them all. You can only accumulate them um, until you're done, until after you're done. So hold until completely done. 
So this is two-phase locking. The phases are the phases which we acquire locks and then the phase in which we um, just hold on to them until we're done. So uh, for two-phase locking, to sort of see why uh, locking works here, typical locking systems, well, there's a lot of variation, typical locking systems associate a separate lock with each record in the database, with each row in each table, for example, um, although they can be more, more coarse-grained. These transactions um, start out holding no locks. Let's say transaction one starts out holding no locks. When it first uses X, before it's allowed to use it, it has to acquire the lock on X. And it may have to wait. Um, and when it first uses Y, it acquires another lock, the lock on Y. Um, when it finishes, after it's done, it can release both. If we ran both these transactions at the same time, um, they're going to basically race to get the lock on X. And whichever of them gets the, manages to get the lock on X first, it will proceed and finish and commit. Um, meantime, the other transaction that didn't manage to get the lock on X first is going to sit here waiting before it, um, before it use, does anything with X until it can acquire the lock. So if transaction two actually got the lock first, um, it would get the value of X, get the value of Y, because um, uh, transaction one hasn't gotten to this point, it hasn't locked Y yet. Uh, it'll print and it'll finish and release its locks. And only then transaction one will be able to acquire the lock on X. And as you can see, that basically forces a serial order um, because it forced, in this case, it forced the order T2 and then when T2 finishes, only then T1. Um, so it, it's explicitly forcing an order which uh, causes the, de it, the execution to follow the definition of serializability. That, you know, it really is executing T2 to completion and only then T1. Um, so we do get correct execution. All right. So one question is why you need to hold the locks until a transaction is completely finished. You might think um, that you could just hold the lock while you were actually using the data, and that would be more efficient, and indeed it would. That is, um, you know, maybe only hold the lock for the period of time in which T2 is actually looking at record X, or maybe only hold the lock on X here for the duration of the add operation, and then immediately release it. And, you know, in that case, that would, if we transaction one, immediately release the lock on X, thereby disobeying this rule, of course. But if it immediately released the lock on X, then transaction two might be able to start a little bit earlier. We get more concurrency, more higher performance. So this rule definitely you know, is bad for performance. So we, we want to make pretty sure that it's, it's good for, that it's required for correctness. Um, so what might happen if transactions did actually release locks um, as early as possible? So suppose T2 here reads X and then immediately releases its lock on X. Um, that would allow T1, since at, now at this point in the execution, T2 doesn't hold any locks because it's just released it, sort of illegally, released the lock on X. Since it holds no locks, that means T1 could completely execute right here. And we already knew from, uh, from before that this interleaving is not correct as it doesn't produce either of these two outputs. Um, similarly, if, uh, if T1 released this lock on X after it finished adding one to X, that would allow all of T2 to slip in right here. And we know also from before that that results in, um, in illegal results. There's um, an additional kind of problem that can come up with releasing locks after modifying data. If T1 were to release the lock on X, it might allow T2 to see the modified version of X here, to see the X after adding one to it, and to print that output, and then t for T2 to complete after printing the incremented value of X. If transaction one were to abort after that point, maybe because bank balance Y doesn't exist, um, or maybe bank balance Y exists, but its balance is zero, and you know, we're not allowed to decrement below zero for bank balances, because that's an overdraft. So T1 might modify X, then abort, and part of the abort has to be undoing its update to X um, in order to 
uh, maintain atomicity. And what that would mean if it released the locks is that transaction two would have seen the sort of phantom value of 11 that went away because T1 aborted. Um, it would have seen a value that, according to the rules, never existed, right? Because um, then the if transaction one aborts, then it's as if it never existed. And so that means the results from T2 had better be as if T2 ran by itself without T1 at all. Um, but if it sees the increment, then it's going to print 11 for x, 11, 10, actually, um, which is uh, just doesn't correspond to any state in the database, given that T1 didn't really um, complete. OK, so that's why uh, those are two dangers that are averted, um, to two violations of serializability that are averted because transactions hold the locks until they're done. Uh, a further um, thing to note about these rules are that it's very easy for them to produce deadlock. So, um, if, you know, for example, if we have two transactions, uh, one of them uh, reads record X, and then reads record Y, and the other transaction reads Y and then X. That's, that's just a deadlock if they run at the same time. They, each of them gets this lock on the record at uh, first read. They don't release till the transactions finish. Um, so they both sit there waiting for the lock that's held by the other transaction. And unless the database does something clever, which it will, um, uh, they'll deadlock forever. And in fact, transactions have various strategies, including tracing cycles or timeouts, in order to detect that uh, they've gotten into the situation. And the database will abort one of these two transactions and undo all its changes and act as if the transaction had never occurred. OK, so that's uh, concurrency control with two-phase locking. And um, this is just completely standard database behavior so far, um, and is the same in uh, single machine databases as it will be in distributed databases that are of little more interest to us. Um, but our next topic is a little is uh, actually specific to building databases or storage systems in general that support transactions um, on. Uh, distributed setting that is splitting the data over multiple machines. Um, so now the topic is um, how to build distributed distributed uh, transactions, um, and in particular, how to cope with failures and uh, more specifically the kind of partial failures of just one of many servers that you often see in distributed systems. So we have distributed syst uh, transactions, and we're worried about how they behave make sure they're serializable um, and also have sort of all or nothing atomicity, even in the face of failures. Um, so uh, you know, you know, what the way this looks like is that we might have two servers. Right? We got server one, and maybe it stores uh, record X in our bank, and we have server two, and maybe it stores record Y. So they all start out with value 10. We need to run these two transactions. That, and transaction one, of course, modifies both x and y. So you know, we need to send messages to the databases saying, oh, please increment x, please decrement y. Um, but it would be easy, if we weren't careful, to get into a situation where we had told server one to increase the balance for x, but then something failed. Maybe the client's sending the requests, or maybe server, the server two that's holding y fails or something. And we never managed to do the second update. Right? So that's one problem is um, failure somewhere may uh, sort of cut the transaction in half. And if we're not careful, it'll cause only half of the transaction to, uh, to, to um, actually take effect. Um, uh, this can happen even without crashes. If, if X does its part in the transaction, it could be that over on server two, server two actually gets the request to uh, decrement uh, bank account Y, but maybe server two discovers this bank account doesn't exist. 
or maybe it does exist and its balance is already zero and can't be decreased, and so it can't do its part of the transaction. But X, look, has already done its part of the transaction, um, so that's a problem that needs to be dealt with. Um, so the, um, the property we want, as I mentioned before, is that all the pieces of the system, either all the pieces of the system should do their part of the transaction or none, right? So, you know, the kind of, the thing we've violated here is uh, we want atomicity against crashes or versus failures, where atomicity is all or not, all uh, parts, all parts of the transaction that we're trying to execute or none of them. Um, and for uh, um, even more, the kind of solution we're going to be looking at is atomic commitments, atomic commit protocols. Um, and the general uh, kind of flavor of atomic commit protocols is that you have a bunch of computers. They're all doing different parts of some larger task. Um, and the atomic commit protocol is going to help the computers decide that either they're all going to do their, they're all capable of doing their part and they're actually going to do it, or something has gone wrong and they're all going to agree that, oh, they're actually none of them are going to do their part of the, uh, whatever the um, overall task is. And the big challenges are, of course, how to cope with various failures, machine failures, loss of messages, um, and it'll turn out that performance is, is also um, a little bit difficult to do a good job with. If the specific protocol we're going to look at, and this is the protocol explained in the reading for today, are two-phase commit. This is an atomic commitment protocol. Um, and this is used both by distributed databases and also by all kinds of other distributed systems that um, might not at first look like traditional databases. The general setting is we assume that, um, off, that in one way or another, the task we need to perform is split up over multiple servers, each of which needs to do some part, a different part, each one of them. Um, so for example, this um, setup I showed here in which the, um, it's really the data that's split up, and so the tasks being split up are incrementing x and decrementing y. The, um, we're going to assume that there's one computer that's driving the transaction, called the transaction coordinator. Um, and there's lots of ways of arranging how the transaction coordinator steps in, but we'll just imagine it as a, a computer that's actually running the transaction. So there's one computer, the transaction coordinator, that's, that's executing the sort of code for the transaction, like the puts and the gets and the adds. And it sends messages to the computers that hold the different pieces of data that need to actually execute the different parts. Um, so for our setup, we're going to have one computer, the transaction coordinator, and um, it's going to be these you know, server one and server two that hold x and y. Transaction coordinator will send a message to server one saying, oh, please increment x. Send a message to server y saying, oh, please decrement y. And then there'll be more messages in order to make sure that uh, either they both do it or neither of them do it. And that's where two-phase commit steps in. Um, something to keep in the back of your mind is that in the full system, there may be many different transactions running concurrently and many transaction coordinators um, sort of executing their own transactions. Uh, and so the various parties here need to keep track of, oh, you know, this is a message for such and such a transaction and where they keep state, like these, turns out these servers are going to maintain tables of locks, for example. And when they keep state like that, they need to keep track of, oh, this is a lock that's being held for transaction 17. So there's a notion of um, transaction IDs um, or TID. And I'm just going to assume, although I'll you know, not actually show it, that every message in the system is tagged with the transaction, with the unique transaction ID of the transaction it applies to. And these IDs are chosen by the transaction coordinator when the transaction starts. So the transaction coordinator will send out, oh, this is a message for transaction ID 95, 
Um, and it'll keep all its state here about the transaction. It'll be tagged with 95 and the various tables um, in the uh, different participants in the transaction will be tagged with the transaction IDs. And so that's another piece of terminology. We have the transaction coordinator. And then the other um, uh, servers that are doing parts of the transaction are called participants. All right, so let me draw out the uh, two-phase commit protocol, example execution. So this is, I'll abbreviate this 2PC for two-phase commit. Um, the parties involved are the uh, transaction coordinator. And we'll just say there's two participants. That is, you know, maybe we're executing the transactions I've shown, X and Y are on different servers. Maybe we've got um, uh, participant A for sure and participant B. These are two different servers holding data. So the transaction coordinator, it's running the whole transaction. It's, it's going to send puts and gets to A and B to um, tell them to you know, read the value of X or Y or add one to X. So we're going to see um, at the beginning of the transaction that the transaction coordinator is sending, for example, maybe a get request to trans to participant A, and it gets a reply, and then maybe it sends a put for um, whatever. And we might see a long sequence of these if there's a complicated transaction. Then um, when transaction coordinator gets to the end of the transaction and um, wants to commit it and, and be able to you know, release all those locks and make the transaction's results visible to the outside world and maybe reply to a client or a human user. So maybe we're assuming there's a sort of external client or human that said, oh, please run this transaction and is waiting for a response. And before we can do any of that, the transaction co coordinator has to make sure that all the different participants can actually do their part of the transaction. Um, and in particular, if there were any puts in the transaction, uh, we need to make sure that the participants who are doing those puts, well, are actually still capable of doing the puts. Um, so in order to find that out, the transaction coordinator sends um, prepare messages to all of the participants. So we're going to send oops, prepare messages to both A and B. And when A or B re receive a prepare message, you know, they know the transaction is nearing completion, but not, not over yet. They look at their state and decide whether they are actually able to complete the transaction. You know, maybe they needed to abort it to break a deadlock, or maybe they've crashed and restarted b between you know, when they um, did the last operation or now, and they've completely forgotten about the transaction and can't complete it. So A and B you know, look at their state and say, oh, I'm going to be able to, or I'm not going to be able to do this transaction. And they respond with either yes or no. So um, the transaction coordinator is waiting for these yes or no votes from each of the participants. Um, if they all say yes, then the transaction can commit. If nothing goes wrong, um, the transaction can commit. And the transaction coordinator sends out a commit message to each of the participants. Um, and then the participants usually reply with an acknowledgment saying, yes, uh, we now know the outcome. So this is I'll call it the acknowledgment. All right, so if they all, so the transaction coordinator sends out repairs. If all of the participants say yes, they can commit. If any one of in any of them, even a single one, says no, actually I cannot complete this transaction because I had a failure or um, there was an inconsistency, like a missing record, and I have to abort. If even a single participant says no at this point, then the transaction coordinator won't commit. It'll send out a round of abort messages saying, oops, um, please retract this um, transaction. 
Um, either way, the, um, after the commit, uh, sort of two, um, two things happen of interest to us. One is the transaction coordinator will emit whatever the um, transaction's output is to the client or human that requested it and say, look, oh yes, the transaction's finished, and so now if it didn't abort, um, if it committed, it's durable. The other interesting thing is that um, in order to obey uh, these locking rules, the participants unlock when they see either a commit or an abort. Um, and indeed, um, in order to obey the two-phase locking rule, each participant locked any data that um, it read as part of doing its part of the transaction. So we're imagining that in each participant, there's a table of the locks associated with the data stored at that participant. Um, and the participants sort of lock things in those tables. Remember, oh, this is, you know, this piece of data, this record is locked for transaction 29. And when finally the committer abort comes back for transaction 29, um, the participant unlocks that data and, and then other transactions can use it. So um, we may have to wait here and this unlock may unblock other transactions. That's really part of the um, serializability machinery. So, you know, so far the reason why this is correct basically is that um, the, if everybody's following this protocol and there's no failures, then the uh, two participants only commit if both of them commit, and if either of them can't commit, um, if either of them has to abort, then they both abort. So we get that either they all do it or none of them do it uh, result that we wanted, um, the atomicity result um, with this protocol so far without, without thinking about failures. And so now our job is to think through in our head all sort of the different kinds of failures that might occur and um, figure out whether the protocol still provides atomicity, either both do it or neither do it, in the face of these failures and how we have to adjust or extend the protocol um, in order to cause it to do the right thing. So the first thing I want to consider is what if B crashes and restarts? I mean, power failure or something, uh, B just sudden, suddenly stops executing and then uh, the power is restored and it, it, it's brought back to life and runs some, maybe some sort of recovery software um, as part of the transaction processing system. Well, there's really two uh, scenarios we have to worry about. One is B might have crashed before sending its yes message back. So if B crashed before sending its yes message back, then it never said yes. So the transaction coordinator couldn't possibly have committed or be about to commit because it has to wait for a yes from all participants. So if B can convince itself that it could not possibly have sent a yes back, um, that is a crash before sending the yes, then B is entitled to unilaterally abort the transaction itself and forget about it because it knows the transaction coordinator can't possibly uh, commit it. So um, um, there's, you know, a number of ways of implementing this. One possibility is that all of B's information about transactions that haven't reached this point is in memory and is simply lost if B crashes and reboots. So B just won't know anything about transactions that haven't, haven't sent yes back yet. Um, and then if the transaction coordinator sends a prepare message to a participant that doesn't know anything about the transaction because it crashed before sending yes, the, tr the participant will say, no, no, I cannot possibly agree to that. You know, please abort. Um, okay, but of course, maybe B crashed after sending a yes back. Um, so that's a little more tricky. Supposing the crash, supposing the B gets to prepare, it's, it's happy, it says, yes, I'm gonna commit. Um, and then it crashes before it gets the commit message uh, from the transaction coordinator. Well, now we are, we're in a totally different situation. B is promised to commit if told to do so because um, it sent a yes back. And for all it knows, and indeed the most likely thing that's happening is the transaction coordinator got yeses from A and B and has sent a commit message to A so that A actually will do its part of the transaction and make it permanent and release locks. Um, and in that case, in order to honor all or nothing, we're absolutely required, if B should crash at this point, that on recovery, that it be still prepared to complete its part of the transaction. 
It doesn't actually know at that point whether, you know, because it hasn't received the commit yet, you know, whether it should commit or not, but it must still be prepared to commit. And what that means, the fact that B can't lose the state for a transaction across crashes and reboots, and it, um, is that before B replies to a prepare, it must um, make the transaction state, the sort of intermediate transaction state, the memory of all the changes it's made, which may have to be undone if there's an abort, plus the record of all the locks the transactions held. It must um, make that durable on disk. In particular, it's almost always in a, in a log on disk. Um, so before B replies yes, to, before B sends the yes for, in reply to a prepare message, it first must write to disk in its log all the information required to commit that transaction. That is, all the new values um, produced by put plus a full list of locks on, on the disk or some other persistent memory before re replying with yes. And then if there should be, if it, B should crash after sending the yes, as part of recovery, when it restarts, it'll look at, his, at its log and say, oh gosh, I was in the middle of a transaction. I had replied yes for transaction 92. I mean, he, you know, here's all the modifications. It should make if committed and all the locks it held. I better restore that state. Um, and then when B finally gets a commit, no one on board, it'll know from having read its log how to actually finish as part of the transaction. So, um, so this is an important thing I left out of the uh, original laying out of this um, protocol is that B must write to its disk at this point. And this is part of what makes two-phase commit a little bit slow is that um, there's these necessary persisting of information here. Okay, so we also have to worry about, um, okay, and the, you know, the final place I guess where you might crash is you might crash, B might crash after receiving the commit um, or, or after, well, um, you might crash after actually processing the commit. And, but in that case, it's, it's made the modifications to, that the transaction needed to make permanent in its database, presumably also on disk, um, before, after it received the commit message. Um, and in that case, there's maybe not anything to do if it restarts because the transaction's finished. So um, when uh, B receives the commit message, it probably writes the um, copies, the uh, modifications from its log onto its permanent storage, releases its locks, um, erases the information about the transaction from its log, and then replies. Um, and of course, we have to worry about, you know, what if it receives a commit message twice? Um, probably the right thing to do is either for B to remember about the transaction, um, that takes memory. So uh, it turns out that if B simply forgets about committed transactions that it's made durable on disk, um, it can reply to a re repeated commit message if it doesn't know anything about that transaction by simply acknowledging it again. Um, and that'll be important a little bit later on. Okay, so that's the story if one of the participants crashes at various awkward points. Um, what about the transaction coordinator? It's also just a single computer. So, you know, if it fails, um, might be a problem. Okay, so, um, again, the critical where things start getting critical is if any party might have committed, um, then we cannot forget about that. If any, either of these participants might have committed, or if the transaction coordinator might have replied to the client, um, then we cannot uh, have that transaction go away. Right? If, if A is committed, but you know, maybe the transaction coordinator sent out a commit message to A, but hadn't gotten around to sending a commit message to B, if it crashes at that point, the transaction coordinator must be prepared on restart to resend the commit messages to make sure that both parties um, know that the transaction is committed. Um, so, um, okay, so. Uh, you know, whether that matters depends on where the transaction coordinator crashes. If it crashes bef before sending commit messages, it doesn't really matter. Neither party, if, you know, since the transaction coordinator didn't send commit messages before crashing, um, it can just abort the transaction. And if either um, participant asks about that transaction because they, you know, see it's in their log but they never got a commit message, uh, the transaction coordinator can say, I don't know anything about that transaction. It must have been aborted, possibly due to a crash. 
So that's what happens if the transaction coordinator crashes before the commit. But if it crashes after sending um, one or more commit message, then it cannot, the transaction coordinator can't be allowed to forget about the transaction. Um, and what that means is that at this point, when the, after the transaction coordinator has made its commit versus abort decision on the basis of these yes, no votes, before sending out any commit messages, it must first write information about the transaction to its log in, in persistent storage, like a disk, that'll still be there if it crashes and restarts. So um, the transaction coordinator, after it receives a full set of yeses or nos, uh, writes the outcome and the transaction ID to its log on disk, and only then starts to send out commit messages. And that way, if it crashes at any point, um, maybe before it sent the first commit message, or after it sent one, or maybe even after it sent all of them, if it crashes at that point, its recovery software will see in the log, aha, it was in the middle of a transaction. The transaction was either known to have been committed or aborted. Um, and as part of recovery, it will resend commit messages to all the participants or abort messages, whatever the decision was, um, in case it hadn't sent them before it crashed. And that's one reason why the participants have to be prepared to receive duplicated commit messages. Um, okay. So, um, there's some other, so the, those are the um, main crash stories. We also have to worry about what happens if messages are lost in the network. You might send a message, maybe the message never got there. You might send a message and be waiting for a reply. Maybe the reply um, was sent, but the reply was dropped. So any one of these messages may be dropped and you need to think through um, what to actually do in each of these cases. So for example, Supposing the transaction coordinator has sent out prepare messages, but hasn't gotten some of the yes or no replies from participants. What are the transaction coordinator's options at that point? Well, one thing I could do is, is send out a new set of prepare messages saying, you know, I didn't get your answer, please tell me your answer, yes or no. And you know, I could keep on doing that for a while. Um, but if one of the participants is down for a long time, we don't want to sit there waiting with locks held, right? Because you know, supposing A is unresponsive, but, but B is up, but because it, we haven't committed or aborted, B is still holding locks, and that may cause other transactions to be waiting. So we don't want to wait forever if we can possibly avoid it. So if the transaction coordinator hasn't gotten yes or no responses after some amount of time from the participants, um, then it can simply unilaterally decide, oh, we're going to abort this transaction. Because it knows, since it didn't get a full set of yes or no messages, of course, it can't possibly have sent a commit yet, so no participant could have committed. Um, so it's always valid to abort if the transaction coordinator hasn't yet committed. So the transaction coordinator times out waiting for yeses or nos because messages were lost or somebody crashed or something. Um, it can just decide, all right, we're aborting this transaction. We'll send out a round of abort messages. And if the, some participant comes back to life and says, oh, you know, I didn't hear back from you about transaction 95, um, the transaction coordinator will see, oh, well, I don't know anything about transaction 95, you know, because it aborted it and erased its state for that transaction. And then it'll tell the participant, you know, you should abort this transaction too. Um, um, similarly, if one of the participants times out waiting for the prepare here, then, you know, if a participant hasn't received a repair, that means it hasn't sent a yes message back, and that means the coordinator can't possibly have sent any commit messages. So if a participant times out here waiting for the repair, it's also always allowed um, to just bail out and decide to abort the transaction. And if at some future time the transaction coordinator comes back to life and sends out repair messages, then uh, B will say, no, I don't know anything about that transaction, so I'm voting no. And that's okay because it can't possibly have committed, started to commit anywhere. So again, if something goes wrong with the network or the transaction coordinator is down for a while um, and the participants are still waiting for prepares, um, it's always valid for participants to abort and thereby release the locks that other transactions may be waiting for. And that can be very important in a busy system. Um, so that's the good news about um, 
if the participants or the transaction coordinators time out waiting for messages from the other parties. Um, however, suppose um, participant B has received a prepare and sent its yes. And so it's in somewhere around here, but it hasn't received the commit. And it's waiting and waiting, and it hasn't gotten a commit back. Maybe something's wrong with the network. Maybe the transaction coordinator is, its network connection has fallen out, or its power has failed or something. But for whatever reason, B has waited a long time, and it still hasn't heard a commit. Um, but it's sitting there holding locks. It's still holding on to those locks for all the records that were used in its part of the transaction. And that means other transactions may be also blocked, waiting for those locks to be released. So we're like pretty eager to um, abort, or, if we possibly can, or release the locks. And so the question is, if B has received repair and replied with yes, is it entitled to unilaterally abort after it's waited, say, you know, 10 seconds or 10 minutes or something um, to get the commit message? And the answer to that, unfortunately, is no. Um, in this uh, region, after receiving the prepare, or after, really after sending the yes and before getting the commit, um, if you time out waiting for the commit, um, you're not allowed to abort. You must keep waiting. You must, it's usually called block. So in this region of the protocol, if you don't receive the commit, you have to wait indefinitely. And the reason is that since B sent back a yes, that means the transaction coordinator may have received a yes. It may have received yes from all of the participants. And it may have started sending out commit messages to some of the participants. And that means that A may have actually seen the commit message and committed and made his changes permanent and unlocked and shown the changes to other transactions. And since that could be the case for all B knows, in this region of the protocol, B cannot unilaterally decide to abort at the times out. It must wait indefinitely to hear from the transaction coordinator as long as it takes. So some human may have to come and repair the transaction coordinator and finally get it started again and have it read its log and see, oh, yes. We committed that transaction and finally send long delayed commit messages. Um, so, um, and, and similarly, if uh, um, it, it, um, on a timeout, you, 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 can't, you can't unilaterally abort. It turns out you can't unilaterally commit either because for all B knows, A might have voted no, but B just hasn't got the abort message yet. So you can, in this region, you can either abort nor commit um, on a timeout. Um, and so this actually, this, this blocking behavior is um, a sort of critical property of two-phase commit. Um, and it's not a happy property. It means if things go wrong, um, you can easily be in a situation where you have to wait for a long time with locks held and holding up other transactions. And so among other things, um, people try really hard to make this part of two-phase committics as fast as humanly possible so that um, the window of time in which a failure might cause you to block with locks held for a long time um, is as small as possible. So they try to make this part of the protocol very lightweight or um, even have variants of the protocols that for certain special cases may not have to wait at all. Um, OK, so that's the basic protocol. Um, one thing to notice about this that is a fundamental part of why we're able to get to actually build a, a protocol that allows A and B to sort of both, you know, they both commit or they both abort. abort. Um, one reason for that is that Really, the decision is made by a single entity. It's made by the transaction coordinator alone. Um, a and B are neither of them, you know, except that they vote no. Um, neither A nor B is, is deciding whether to commit or not. Um, and they certainly are not engaged in a conversation with each other to try to reach agreement about, oh, what is the other thinking? Are they thinking to commit? Maybe I'll commit too. Instead, um, we have this much, this quite sort of fundamentally simple protocol in which um, only the transaction coordinator makes the decision, a single entity, and it just tells the other party, here's my decision, please go do it. Um, the penalty for that, um, for having the transaction coordinator, really the single entity make the final decision, again, is the fact that 
Um, you have to block. There's some points at which you have to block waiting for the transaction coordinate, coordinator to tell you what the decision was. One um, further question is that um, we know the transaction coordinator must remember information about transactions in its log in case it crashes. Um, and so one question is when the transaction coordinator can forget about information in its log about transactions. And the answer to that is that if it manages to get a full set of acknowledgments from the participants, then it knows that all the participants know that that transaction committed or aborted, that all the transactions know, uh, participants know the fate of that transaction and have done their part in it, and will never need to know that information, right, since they both acknowledged it. So when the transaction coordinator gets acknowledgments, it can erase all information, all memory of the transaction. Um, similarly, participants, once they've received a commit or abort message and done their part in the transaction and made their updates permanent and released their locks, at that point, the participants also can completely forget about that transaction um, after they send their acknowledgment back to the transaction coordinator. Um, now, of course, the transaction coordinator may not get their acknowledgment and may send and may therefore decide to resend the commit message on the theory that maybe it was lost. Um, and in that case, a participant, if it receives a commit message for a transaction which it knows nothing about because it's forgotten about it, um, then the participant can just send another acknowledgment back because it knows that um, if it gets a commit message for an unknown transaction, it must be because it had forgotten about it because it already knew whether it committed or aborted. Um, okay, so, so that's two-phase commit um, for atomic commitment. Um, for a little perspective, two-phase commit is used in um, a lot of sharded databases that have split up their data among multiple servers. Um, and, and it's used specifically um, in databases or uh, storage systems that need to support transactions in which records, in which multiple records may be read or written. There's a lot of some more specialized um, storage systems that um, don't allow you to have transactions on multiple records. And for them, you don't need it. You don't need this kind of, you don't need two-phase commit if um, the storage system doesn't allow multi-record transactions. But if you have multi-record transactions and you shard the data across multiple servers, then you um, need to support either two-phase, you need to support two-phase commit if you want to get um, asset transactions. However, two-phase commit has an evil reputation um, one reason is it's slow due to multiple rounds of messages. There's a lot of chit chat here in order to get uh, a transaction that involves multiple participants to finish. Um, there's in addition a lot of disk writes, both A and B have to not just write data to their disk um, between the prepare and the sending of the yes, they have to wait for that disk write to finish. So certainly if you're using a mechanical drive that takes 10 milliseconds uh, to append to the log, that puts a real serious limit on how fast participants can process transactions. You know, 10 milliseconds a pop means, um, you know, without some cleverness, you're limited to 100 transactions per second, which is uh, pretty slow. And in addition, the, the transaction coordinator also has a point in which it must, um, after it receives the last yes, it must first write to its log, make sure the data is safe on disk, and only then is it allowed to send the commit messages. Um, and that's another 10 milliseconds. And, both of these are 10 millisecond periods in which locks are held in the participants and other transactions are slowed up. And I keep mentioning that, but it's very important because in a busy transaction processing system, there's lots and lots of transactions. Um, and many of them may be waiting for the same data. And we'd really uh, prefer not to hold locks over long periods of time in which there's lots of messages going back and forth and we have to wait for long disk writes. Uh, but two-phase commit forces us to do those waits um, and a further problem with it is that if anything goes wrong, messages are lost, something crashes, then if you're not, uh, if you're a little bit unlucky, then the participants have to wait for long times with locks held. So therefore, um, two-phase commit, you really only see it within relatively small domains, within a single machine room, within a single organization. Um, you don't see it, um, for example, to do transfers between banks, between different banks. You might possibly see it 
within a bank, um, if it's sharded, its database, but you would never see two-phase commit run between dis distinct organizations that were maybe physically separate because of this blocking business. Um, you don't want to put the fate of you know, your database and whether it's operational in the hands of some other organization where if they crash at the wrong time, you're forced to, your database is forced to hold locks for a long time. Um, and because it's so slow also, there's a lot, a lot of research has gone into um, uh, either making it fast or relaxing the rules in various ways to allow it to be faster or specializing two-phase commit um, for very specific situations um, in which you, you, know, you can shave a message or a write to the disk or something off it because you know you're only supporting a certain limited kind of transactions. And we'll, we'll see a fair amount of this in the rest of the course. Um, one question that comes up a lot, um, this um, uh, exchange here where you have a leader essentially and it sends these messages to the followers and um, you know, we can only go forward if the leader can only proceed if it receives you know, acknowledgments, replies from um, enough of the followers. This looks a lot like Raft. Um, this construction looks a lot like Raft. However, uh, the properties of the protocol and what you get out of it turn out to be quite different from what we get out of Raft. They solve very different problems. Um, so the, the way to think about it is that you use Raft to get high availability by replicating data on multiple participants, on multiple peers. That is, the point of Raft is to be able to operate even though some of the servers involved have crashed or are not reachable. Um, and you can do this in Raft. Raft can do this because all the servers are doing the same thing. They're doing the same thing, so we don't need all of them to participate. We only need a majority. Um, Two-phase commit, however, the participants are not at all all doing the same thing. The participants are each doing a different part of the transaction. You know, A may be incrementing record X, and B may be decrementing record Y. So two-phase commit, all the, all the participants are doing something different. They all have to do their part in order for the transaction to finish. You really need to wait for every single one of the participants um, to do their thing. So, okay, so, so we got, um, you know, Raft is replicating, doesn't need everybody to do their thing. Two-phase commit, everybody's doing something different that has to get done. Two-phase commit um, does not help at all with availability. You know, Raft is all about availability. It can go on even if some of the participants are not responding. Um, Two-phase commit is actually not at all available. It's not highly available at all. If anything goes wrong, we risk having to wait until that's repaired. If the transaction coordinator crashes at the wrong time, we simply have to wait for it to come up and read its log and send out the commit messages, right? If, if one of these participants, you know, crashes at the wrong time, you know, if we're lucky, we simply have to abort. And if we're not lucky, we have to say, you know, did you finish that? Did you finish that? Um, so two-phase commit is not at all about high availability. In fact, it's, it's a, it's quite low availability as such things go. Any crash can hold up the whole system. Um, and of course, Raft doesn't ensure that all the participants um, do whatever the operation is. It only requires a majority. There may be a minority that totally didn't do the operation at all. Um, and that's how the fact that Raft, all the participants do the same thing, and we don't have to wait for all of them, is why Raft gets high availability. Um, so these are quite different protocols. Um, it is, however, possible to, to usefully combine them. Like two-phase commit is uh, you know, really vulnerable to failures. Um, it's correct with failures, but it's not available with failures. So the question is, could you build some sort of combined system that um, has the high availability of RAF through replication, but um, has two-phase commit's ability to cause various different parties each to do their part of the transaction? And the construction you want, actually, is to use Raft or Paxos or some other um, protocol like that to rep individually replicate each of the different parties. So then we would, for this setup, we would have like three different clusters. Um, 
the transaction coordinator would actually be a replicated service with um, you know, three servers. And you know, we'd run a raft on these three servers. One would be elected as a leader. They'd have replicated state. They'd have a log that helped them replicate. We would only have to wait for a majority. The leader, we'd only have to have a majority of these to be up in order for the transaction coordinator to do its work. And of course, they would all in, you know, sort of execute through the various stages of the transaction and the two-phase commit protocol um, by basically by appending uh, relevant records to their logs. And then each of the participants would also be um, a cluster of a, rep a raft replicated cluster. So we would end up, and you know, they would exchange messages back and forth. Um, you know, we'd send a commit message from the uh, replicated transaction coordinator service to the replicated A server and the replicated B server. Um, and this is, you know, this is admittedly somewhat elaborate, um, but it does show you that you can combine these ideas to get a combination of high availability because any one of these servers can crash and um, the remaining two can keep operating, plus we get um, this atomic commitment of A and B are, are doing completely different parts of the same transaction, and we can use two-phase commit um, to have the transaction coordinator ensure that you know, they either both commit the whole thing or um, they both abort their parts of the transaction. Um, you'll actually build something very much like this as part of Lab 4, in which you will indeed build a sharded database where each shard is replicated in this form and there's a, basically a configuration manager which will um, al allow essentially transactional shifting of chunks of shards of data from one raft cluster to another um, under the control of um, something that looks a lot like a transaction coordinator. Um, so Lab 4 is like this. And in addition, um, in a little bit, we'll be reading a paper called Spanner, which describes a real-life database used by Google that um, uses, also uses this construction in order to do transactional rights to a database. All right, thank you. <laughs>